you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Show.com. The Show.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We're so certainly appreciative that you have joined with us today in the uh, holy matrimony of the Chris Voss Show, the giant cult religion in the sky. It's not a cult. Don't, don't, don't start doing that, Chris. The giant podcast in the sky, 14 years, 14 hundred episodes, two to three new podcasts a day of the most brilliant minds we can book on this show. Like literally, we only take the most brilliant of minds. And then there's me. So there's that. <laughs> Anyway, guys, uh, we're going to be talking about the UFC today and the story behind the UFC. You may have heard of it. It's a giant, uh, it's a giant federation of uh, some stuff that goes on. <laughs> so we're going to get into it and find out what it means and what it's about and how it was built and how the UFC turned into a ten billion dollar industry in the meantime go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss youtube.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss over on tiktok where chris foss one and the chris foss show podcast as well see what we're producing over there i'm talking to people uh daily like uh i guess you're supposed to over there i don't know you talk about stupid stuff i will not dance on that that will not happen uh he's the author of the latest book that just came out uh june 20th 2023 cage kings how an unlikely group of moguls, champions, and hustlers transformed the UFC into a 10 billion, 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 as a B, industry. Uh, and that's just one. There. Just into a $10 billion industry. People are going to be double, tripling the billion when they search for it on Amazon. So don't do that. Uh, Michael Thompson is on the show with us today, and he'll be talking to us about his amazing insight research in the book. He is a writer in New York. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, Slate, Vanity Fair, The Daily Beast, e Aeon, uh, Forbes, Al Jazeera America, Adult, Talking Points Memo, Los Angeles Review of Books, Complex, The Paris Review, N Plus One, Book Forum, The Believer, The New Republic, Kill Screen, The New Inquiry, and The Millions, and now he's reached the Pinnacle's career, The Chris Foss Show. Welcome to the show, Michael. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Sorry. There you go. I'm glad we could finally just cap off, you know, just the pinnacle of your resume there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I should have shortened the list. I, I was getting a little bored myself listening to all those. Like, I don't think do we have four, any from... stop at four. Right? There you go. I don't think we have anybody from Slate or Al Jazeera America on. We should look into that and see what's going on there. So uh, give us the dot com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. A dot com. Mm -hmm. Or dot net or, you know, whatever uh, Twitter. Uh, I largely just operate on a Gmail at this point. <laughs> I've ah. given up having a port. I have a portfolio site, but. Um, okay. I have a Twitter account that I never really All look right. at or use that often anymore. But, you know. All right. Well, best thing to do is just to go to the Amazon link on the Chris Foss show and order up the book. And then you can send him a nice, you can tell him what you think of him on the review. There you exactly. go. Does that work? Yeah. Does that work good? Sure. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, what motivated you want to write this latest book? And I think you have two or three books, don't you? Yeah. Well, sorry. I, I wrote kind of a, a essay collection about like, love and dating and stuff like mm. 10 12 years ago and then i had an essay in an anthology about um american cities where i wrote about the city i grew up in fresno uh which coincidentally is one of the most fervent um one of the most fervent mixed martial arts fan towns according to really? a, one one recent uh, audience survey mm. um so i i the book had a couple of different sort of stages. Originally, I wanted to write a history of prize fighting across, mm -hmm. you know, a couple hundred years to kind of look at the way um, how different sort of eras sort of gravitated to violence in different ways and how they presented it um, mm -hmm. culturally. And then 
you know, over the course of about a year and a half, that kind of whittled down. I got some very helpful suggestions from my editor at Simon and Schuster. Is like, why don't you just tell the history of one time and place instead of stretching it out across, you know, mm-hmm. all of these things. You might be able to go deeper if you just sort of focus a little more narrowly on just this time and place. And so, I mean, the UFC was the most obvious choice in part because I've been a fan my whole life. I was a junior in high school when the first one came out and it kind of every stage in my life, it's always sort of been there in the background, partly because I was, I was always interested in martial arts and boxing and fighting. Um, And also partly because they were interested in people like me, my demographic, I was their target audience. And I was sort of curious about what made, you know, my generation, my specific age cohort, so valuable to companies like the UFC? Why, what, what kind of business were they building out of a kind of audience of people like me? What was the sort of mechanisms behind the scenes that, that made that work financially? So that was there fun. you go. That, that's yeah, interesting yeah. Th- that you mentioned the span of time and the arc of generations, mm-hmm. because I grew up with boxing. I grew up with Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali and uh, Frazier. And uh, who did I just do an invitation of? I always forget his name, uh, but I grew up watching ABC Wide World of Sports and yeah, uh, 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 Crow. Ah, why can't I remember? Uh, I can't remember the the, the famous uh, ABC announcer who you know he was he was Cosell. Cosell, how yeah. wet Cosell? Yeah, this is how wet Cosell. Um, and I, I, I just, I thought he was the greatest dude ever. And of course, you know, watching those fights, those the Muhammad Ali in his prime, just just something else to, to behold. And, uh, and then generationally, weirdly, my brother never got into it, but he got into, uh, a world wrestling or world mm-hmm. wrestling federation, WWF. Yeah. I still to this day mm-hmm. think it's real or he thinks it's real. I think to this day, which may explain his, uh, who he votes for and pull in as a president. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then you, as you mentioned, uh, you know, you, you kind of came of age under UFC. So it's interesting Kind of how uh, that develops as time has gone by. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of back and forth between the worlds of pro wrestling and the UFC too. I think Josh Gross, who wrote the history of the Muhammad Ali versus Antonio Inoki fight, um, he sort of fished out of the archives. But apparently, Vince McMahon Sr., Vince McMahon's dad, who sort of got the the WWF off the ground and turned it into a juggernaut. In the 60s, he used to use the phrase mixed martial arts to promote the WWF oh. and like pro wrestling. So it's sort of, you know, it's it's an idea that's got a long history. And, and the Fertitta brothers in 2000, when they brought the company um, and took it over, they used a lot of um, the WWF at that time it was pre WWE. They used a lot of the legal framework for how that business was structured for like fighter contracts and you know, just revenue modeling to see how they could make the UFC a, a success. There you go. <laughs> and, and your title of the book is how an unlikely group of moguls, champions, and hustlers hmm. transform the UFC. Give us like a 30,000 overview of the book, if you would, please. And, and, uh, just kind of a top down. So <laughs> we'll get the deets. Um, yeah, sure. I, you know, my, my glib way of describing it was kind of war and peace for the tribal <laughs> tattoos and cargo shorts generation of, of suburban men. Um, the cargo but, shorts. Wow. Shots fired. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you know, you know if you know, you know, if you know, you know, yeah. <clears throat> um, it's, it's a sprawling kind of story. It, it spans multiple generations. It starts in the nineties. Um, when the business environment was very different. The whole plan for the company was a very different plan than what we know of today as a UFC. But it, it kind of just, you know, tries to chart and track the lives of both the fighters involved in the UFC and the people running the UFC and how, you know, in parallel, you know, the, the company shaped each of their lives and ambitions and what they hoped for whether that's, you know, Dana White or Bob Myrowitz or Art Davey or, you know, the Fertitta brothers on the sort of corporate side. Mm-hmm. And then on the fighter side, I picked four main fighters that kind of spanned the, the company's whole sort of history up to the sale in 2016. It's Randy Couture, Nick Diaz and his brother, Nate, Ronda Rousey, and then Conor McGregor is sort of the big finish. 
There um, you go. Do you get into Dana White much? I mean, yeah, absolutely. He's kind of the guy he's that short, yeah, yeah, he gets the last word in the book. How, were they friendly to you? Did they give you any interviews or any space time? Um, the UFC cooperated a bit. They gave me a few interviews, and I I went out to Vegas a few times to talk. Um, kind of off the record just about what the book was oh. and what, what i was interested in like what are you writing presenting. yeah you know to feel me out and you know i got to visit the offices a little bit and, that um, office is massive out there isn't it that facility yeah i kind of described it in the book in the, in the epilogue i sort of write about one of those trips it's it feels almost like a military compound like you're in a green oh, yeah. zone or something it's like a big sort of barrier around it there's like a big quarter mile parking lot before you can get up to the and then it's just this cube in the middle of nowhere and it is, yeah. it's out in the middle of nowhere like, which is pretty much i think you just described vegas actually so yeah kind of yeah <laughs> there's another book just about vegas there you go yeah there's, that could there's be a, the next a couple one of those, yeah the parking spots of vegas uh Hi, folks. Here's Foss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching, speaking, and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements, if you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer, and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff. Uh, with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO, and be sure to check out Chris Voss Leadership institute.com now back to the show you know what's interesting to me is you you talk about the rise of this thing and it went through a, a couple of kerfuffles that almost mm -hmm. seemed like it was going to kill it and put it out of business and i think this is why books like yours in the story makes it much more salient and interesting because this wasn't just a, like an overnight success story it's like hey we're going to do this and boom um, you know, at one point they started doing the fights and, and you'll, you'll, I'm sure fill me in better on this, but they were, they were banned in many States and how, how did that play in and, and, uh, and, and some of the details that you uncover in your book? Um, yeah, it, I think that's one of the interesting things I kind of tried to tease out in the first chapter a little bit was kind of how small an operation it was initially. Like mm -hmm. anyone that maybe has worked in the entertainment industry like before i started writing i worked in the movie industry for a while and like you know the way that sort of movies and tv shows are designed to be able to scale up very quickly for like a five or six week shoot and then just evaporate again into like a producer and an assistant sitting on a studio lot mm -hmm. that's kind of the world the ufc came out of where you know it was a very small you know the company that financed it originally or partially mm -hmm. financed it um semaphore entertainment group um you know, they're a subsidiary of BMG, the big music conglomerate. And, you know, their their sort of idea was that they were supposed to find original pay-per-view programming. And, you know, they had a pretty small staff and they found Art Davey, who was pitching this idea for what would become the UFC. And they kind of just put it together in a matter of months. Davey had been working on it on his own for a couple of years at that point. But by the time he got their backing, it went, I think, within seven or eight months from them being interested. I think he had called them in March of 1993 and they targeted an October sort of live broadcast. And so the whole thing, you know, it was a really small number of people and a really short period of time and they just ran with it. And so they were not at the point of like, doing exhaustive legal research or anything like that. They were just sort of like getting over yeah. every hurdle as quickly and simply as possible. And, um, and, and it was interesting how the put, how big the pushback was, I think when it first launched, yeah. um, you know, I mean, it, 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 you, you see this with the, uh, the establishment of, you know, I, I lived in Utah during skiing when they finally came out with snowboards. And, oh my God, that, that was heresy. And, you know, they were getting banned and kicked off the, off the, uh, off the slopes and banned from, you know, skiing. And then, you know, years later they finally adopt to it. And I think, you know, boxing was so big back then, uh, the world wrestling federation, I don't know if they opposed it, but I, I believe it was the boxing commissions and stuff that were like, this is not going to fly. Is that how it worked? Yeah. I mean, it, it initially started and that the, there was an ambiguity with a lot of um, boxing commission. That's why they launched in Denver because there wasn't a 
commission there to interfere one way or the other. So they couldn't get approval or not. So, um, but as soon as people realized that's how they were operating, then a lot of states, a lot of local politicians, you know, some just sort of cynically for PR wins, but others out of kind of a genuine moral conviction really started to, to try and oppose the sport. Um, but initially, the UFC had a number of early wins in court because the courts would rule that um, because it was such a new sport, the, the, the laws sort of defining how athletic commissions uh-huh. operated, they didn't actually have um, the ability to, to, you know, oversee mixed martial arts because it's, you know, they're, the way their laws were written were about boxing, mm-hmm. about, you know, other sports. They don't specifically mention mixed martial arts or you know cage fighting. So a lot of courts early on said like you you know you don't have authority to stop this under the specific law that that governs the commission. Mm-hmm. And they figured that pretty quickly. And that's when you had this sort of cascade of of state legislatures sort of correcting that loophole pretty quickly, mm-hmm. and then putting pressure on the pay per view providers. And um, I think starting in ninety seven, that's when all the pay per view providers push the UFC off to kind of appease John McCain. Um, and then, you know, the only place you could get UFC from 97 to 2001 was um, satellite pay-per-view, which yeah. was like 20% of the amount of homes that you had with linear cable pay-per-view. So and they, re- they really struggled. And then you have a quote from the book, Senator McCain, John McCain, once this derived, decried martial arts as human cockfighting mm-hmm. um you know i told you in the pre-show my friend at club axis uh cory draper used to hold the ufc fights when they got banned everywhere and yeah. um utah was U- utahs loved it man they caught on to it really quick um and my models for my model agency used to be the the model girls the card girls or whatever and uh, i've got plenty of photos of that i, I never even thought of that but um uh, uh, what was interesting was watching them because I would get ringside because I, you know, they were my girls. And so it was, you know, you're like, Hey, I get ringside. But I remember it was hard to, it was hard to deal with, uh, with the violence level of it. Cause you weren't used to it. And mm-hmm. I felt, I felt stuck in the mud. Like, you know, I, Muhammad Ali boxer, there's just, there's something of class to it, which there probably isn't. It's two men beating each other to death. Um, but I remember watching it and I remember telling the joke that I've told ever since that, that, well, now I know what, uh, prison grape looks like, Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the violence and men crawling around with each other on the floor and, and just, it, it didn't seem, it seemed to be way more violent to me. And I think it is, uh, than boxing. But it was hard to wrap my head around. I mean, basically, is what I'm saying. I, I had a hard time with it. I think a lot of people did, and uh, I don't know what that means or what how that's pertinent. But uh, it, it was something that I think people kind of struggled. Maybe we had to come to an agreement with that as a society. Go, yeah, okay, let's let's, let's let this roll. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's still you know some debate about whether it, it's more or less violent. You know, the MMA people say it's it's less violent in boxing because it's mm-hmm. less about head trauma and Um, you know there's a lot of sparring is grappling sparring it's not you know just striking sparring it's it's more of a mix and the gloves and you know allow you to transmit head trauma um it takes a lot more force with gloves on to knock someone out than with the four ounce gloves um i i would in the end of the day i think they're both probably equally violent I think mm-hmm. the UFC was just a new form of violence that people weren't used to. And there was a sort of barbarism to, especially the early shows where, you know, um, you know, I kind of quote in the, in the book that, you know, people were pulling each other's hair out in the first UFC and the commentator, <laughs> Kathy Long, who was a, a world champion kickboxer who was doing color commentary. was like, wow, you can see just tufts of hair falling down into the octagon there. That's not wow. something you see every day. But that was legal too, you know. And yeah. there was a period where groin strikes were legal. He had some absurd kind of moments of two guys just on the ground, just taking turns, just like <laughs> walloping each other's crotches. It's Fridays at my house. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Ask the wife. Um, the uh, you know, and 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 when you really think about it, like you mentioned, it is a bit high minded to say, well, it's more violent. I mean, I was I paid for the pay per view, or I watched what's his face chew off mm-hmm. a guy's ear. What was that fight? 
Um, Vander Holyfield, yeah. Mike Tyson, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Mike Tyson. And uh, yeah, that was that was a bit violent. Uh, in fact, I think Vander Holyfield probably uh, got the brunt of that one. So uh, they they tend they're doing this thing, and then they meet, I believe, the Vegas people, right? Uh, yeah. It, so um, the original owner of the UFC, Bob Meyerowitz, was trying to get the company back on cable, sort of in a desperate push. And he was going all over the country trying to get athletic commissions to sanction it and sort mm -hmm. of um, undo some of the political damage that had come out of their sort of first couple of years of runaway success where they were kind of making more money than they were prepared to, I think, initially even. Um, and Lorenzo Fertitta was the youngest member of the Nevada State Athletic uh, Commission mm -hmm. um, at that time. And so he was one of the people that um, Bob Meyerowitz and a lobbyist he brought with him was trying to persuade to um, let the UFC hold events in Nevada because he had been told by some cable operators that if he got a big state, a state that had a boxing legacy like Nevada, that was as, as respected as the Nevada commission was, you know, for whatever you take that for, mm -hmm. um, if he could get that, something like that, then they would consider putting it back on regular pay-per-view and sort of save him from the satellite kind of limbo zone he was in. And, you know, that would, that would turn the money pipe back on. It would it'd help him be able to start turning a profit again. And tell um, us about the Fertitas, because, I mean, it was this a was this a, a kind of a linchpin moment where legitimate money comes in and kind of well a big money comes in and kind of legitimizes them and and uh, and that kind of helps move the needle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's the big catalyst. So the Fertitta brothers, Lorenzo and Frank the Third, they they are heir to Station Casinos, um, which is the the first major locals gaming casino in Las Vegas. Their father, Frank Jr., started it in the mid-1970s uh, with the idea that this would just be a casino for local people. It wouldn't be a tourist attraction. It was off the strip. It was out in the middle of nowhere on Sahara Boulevard. Like, And all it would be was sort of bingo, slot machines, you know, some light table games, and just a friendly, low-key place for people to kind of let off steam. And it, you know, over a few decades, it sort of transformed into a giant billion dollar a year business. So by 2000, which is the year that they, um, they took over the UFC, the end of 2000, that mm -hmm. same year station brought in almost a billion dollars. I think it was $980 million wow. in revenue for the year. Um, from, I think at that point they had something like 16 different casinos, uh, around Las Vegas. All off strip, all in the sort of all off strip, strip, all local, yeah. yeah. And they really controlled it, so they had deep, deep pockets, and they had even deeper access to to credit and banking, and um, they had a lot of connections politically, um, and uh, they had a lot of one of the, one of the people they wound up hiring later on came from the Nevada Attorney General's office. Um, another person they hired to help deal with um, athletic regulations is Mark Ratner, who was another member of the athletic commission in Nevada. Um, so, you know, they, they had a lot of cachet with people that Bob Meyerowitz didn't. And sort of like I was saying earlier that, you know, about how small an operation the UFC originally was. And that's sort of part of how they got in so much trouble is that, you know, they had more success than they were prepared to really <laughs> deal with sort of politically, legally, financially, it sort of just all happened all at once. And, you know, they're trying to solve seven different problems, big problems when they're really only equipped to do, you know, one or two at a time. Um, but the Fertitas had money, they had capital, they had reputation that allowed them to deal with all seven of those problems simultaneously. And they had money to, keep going without having just financial crisis after financial crisis um, in the interim before they really, you know, turn the company around. They were able to lose, you know, six, seven million dollars a year. And it, it wasn't a threat to their livelihood. You know, they could lose seven million dollars when they're making nine hundred eighty million dollars from the gaming business. You know, that's that's not a, a sort of fundamental threat to their their well-being the way it was for semaphore 
There you go. And it just goes through this whole arc. And, and now it's, you know, it's just huge mainstream. They make a lot of money. What are some of the most, uh, more surprising, maybe stories or teasers or tidbits you can give us maybe that you, you found in the book that you were just like, wow, people are really going to be mind blown when they read about this. Yeah, that's a tricky question. I actually have to think about that for a while. Part of it, because it's such a complicated story. I mean, one yeah. of the hard parts about writing the book was trying to condense uh, the history of a company, which now is like, you know, 400 some employees big, not counting Endeavor and and all the other, how to make that a sort of coherent um, vision. So, I mean, a lot of the things that I found most memorable were really like character moments. Um, mm-hmm. Here's what I actually had to cut this out of the book, but I, I um, spent some time with Nick and Nate Diaz's boxing coach, Richard Perez, um, who I think is just a great guy. And I, I love talking with him, but he's a guy that's, you know, he doesn't get a lot of um, notoriety in, in MMA circles, but um he was, he's such an interesting character. He was, he was thrown out of his house when he was 14 because he was epileptic and his father was deeply religious. So he thought mm-hmm. when his son was having seizures, he was being possessed by demons. He was completely Holy like crap. freaked out by it. So he Jesus. kicked him out and his father had also been a pro boxer and he had mm-hmm. brought up all his kids to learn how to box. He brought them to the gym with him, you know, when they were younger so when Richard found himself out on his own for the first time, um, boxing was the only way he knew how to support himself. So he would make money by offering to be a sparring partner. He'd spar for 25 bucks a session with guys in Fresno, which is my hometown. That's where he grew up too. Um, and just, you know, as a, as a teenager, completely alone, that was his one way of sort of not ending up homeless or on the streets. And then, wow. you know, that led him to eventually being a boxing coach. Um, and it, but even that, you know, he, he coached world champions, but he never made enough from it that he was able to quit his day job. So when he met Nick and Nate, he was still working as a high school janitor and then just going to the gym at night to train fighters. And it, it's stuff like that. Those kind of details, it's sort of like the human, kind of Mm -hmm. circumstance that lead people into fighting and and what kind of characterizes that the relationship people have over a lifetime in fighting sports that to me was was the most meaningful like it that's the stuff that sticks with me after having gone through this whole six-year process of reporting this stuff out there you go. Yeah, the the um and then even with the Fertitis, they they had trouble with uh that there was financial issues for them when the fall of that I think it was the 2008 uh, crisis where they've kind of extended themselves 2008 housing crisis because yeah. I remember they had several projects under works uh for the station casinos. They were building like I don't know station casino like 7-Elevens um at one point or they, they I think it was projected I remember the, uh, I think it was the North Las Vegas one that uh, got, into, got them kind of overextended in trouble, I think, when they were building it. Yeah, and, that had just opened when the collapse yeah. happened. And yeah. They had I just remember. gone public, too, and they had, they, so they had, um, or they had gone, sorry, they had gone um, private, so they had to buy back all their shares, and they, de- they took on a huge amount of debt to do that. Mm-hmm. And then they wound up right when the crisis had, that was about a year before the real estate collapse. And so Mm. they, they, you know, they couldn't service their own debt. So they had to go into bankruptcy proceedings. Yeah. Crazy, (laughs) crazy story. And, and somehow the UFC just keeps building through this all and just keeps going. Uh, I think Dana White survived a few different, uh, I don't know, moments or I think there was some, I think sometimes there was something they either said or different things that happened. I know a couple of the fighters have gotten in trouble. I think there's one in trouble right now. Um, and there's a lot of it. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of interesting characters doing interesting things with maybe a little too much testosterone or maybe some other things going on. Um, but yeah, they, it seems like they, you know, they just keep plowing through and, and keep growing and, and, um, uh, it just appears there's no end in sight. In fact, I think it's technically bigger than boxing right now. Is boxing even still a thing anymore? I guess it is for lightweight yeah. and medium. I don't even care for lightweight medium. Like I, 
I, like I said, I guess I'm just an old, I'm an old guy who's on the lawn going, get off my lawn, kids. I mean, I still love the heavyweights, you know, all that fighting. And when I see the little guys fighting, I'm like, well, that's cute. But I mean, people love it. So what do I know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's a yeah. common theme in the UFC too. I've, one of my best friends only watches heavyweight fights. Yeah. Like, so, okay. So I don't feel so bad that I'm, no, yeah, I'm not that old stick of a mud that, you know, I mean, there's uh, the, if you grew up watching fucking Ollie and Frazier and uh, all the greats from back in that day, it was just, uh, it was an extraordinary time to live through. It just, yeah. and, and the fighting, when you've seen the Rumble in the Jungle, when you've seen the Rope Dope, um, you know, and, and you watching, watching, uh, um, uh, watching uh what's his face spar just verbally with you know they were always arguing uh the announcer from abc wide world of sports uh how it go sell uh mm-hmm. always arguing and sparring with uh with Muhammad Ali. I mean, it was just a magical time of history um and the characters were just seemed larger than life and you know i mean i i could tell that the wf was fake I had to, sorry, did I break anybody's feelings? Did I did I tell somebody Santa Claus is isn't, isn't real? Yeah. Uh, so there's that. Uh, anything more you want to tease out of the book, Michael? Before we go and before I finish assaulting uh, anybody who likes wrestling at this point. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not really a teasing kind of person. All right. I, well, I like spoilers. That's my. I like spoilers. So I'll just tell you how it ends. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, technically, you got a, a couple books you can work on for this uh, going on here and on there. Uh, I think, you know, Dana White's an extraordinary, interesting guy. Um, is he, would you frame him as a consummate leader, visionary, entrepreneur, uh, endless promoter? Is, is he really that dude? Is, can you really look at the UFC and say, this thing made it because of him? Um, it made it in the form that it's currently in because of him. Oh. And, uh, I think it would have survived regardless. I think that's one of the sort of myths that gets told a lot that really you know, MMA wouldn't exist without UFC and Dana. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were, you know, the Fertitas and Dana White were certainly central to MMA getting formed in, in the state that it's currently in. Mm-hmm. But you know, even when the UFC in the late nineties was going through its difficulties, pride was massive in Japan. There was a massive global audience um, growing. That's part of what made it such an appealing acquisition target for the Fertitas. I think they, yeah. you know, they knew they were getting an underpriced asset for $2 million. That, $2 you know, million? Dollars. It, yeah. They I remember the that. That's coming and, back to me. Wow. $2 million. You know, Myra was offered it offered him 50% for a million dollars. Um, and they said, we'll take the whole thing for two. Wow. But, you know, part of what made that such a good deal is in Japan, you were having, you know, 10, 20 million people watch pride events, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that doesn't translate to American revenue per se, but there's still enough of a spillover audience and enough of a kind of cultural memory and even mm-hmm. separate from the UFC, you had this whole new generation of regional fight promoters like your friend you're talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah. Um, you know, King of the Cage was going on in California. Mm-hmm. IFC had been going on. The IFC actually had the first um, free televised MMA event, um, I think, in all the United States, which was an, uh, a broadcast on a local affiliate in Alabama in advance of one of their shows down there in, I think, 98. 98 or 99. Um, but there was this, you know, um, you know, there's a whole host of people working on these sort of knockoffs and follow ons from the original UFC success. So there was a real churn there in the market, you know, and there was things were catching, it was slowly kind of building and bubbling up. It was just <clears throat> whether that would have led to, you know, the state of MMA today that we have that we're all familiar with, with one unified sort of coherent brand which is something you don't have in boxing. You know, that's part of, yeah. you know, one of the struggles that, that boxing has had is sort of like, there's nowhere to go to follow a coherent, you know, narrative about who's fighting who and why. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's what I wanted to really sort of write about in the book is not whether they sort of saved MMA, but how 
their efforts created MMA that we know today in the particular form. There you and, go. Yeah. Maybe it'll be as big as that new thing they have out where you slap each other in the face. Have you seen that thing? Yeah. Is that part so of UFC? Are they the ones that are that's back part of, That's the Fertitas and Dana White. Damn, and, man. Uh, I believe John Mulkey is involved. He's the old CFO from the UFC. The I've started years. watching. I've started watching some of those things, and I'm just like, "Holy crap! That looks like a." I mean, the the, the football people are like, "Wow, that's more." You know, mm. who, who's the Pittsburgh Steelers? Uh, um, old quarterback from the '70s, Terry he's Bradshaw. Out, Terry Bradshaw. I mean, he's had like I think at least uh, somewhere under a hundred uh, concussions. I think in his lifetime. I don't know. He doesn't remember either. Mm. Um, but uh, you watch that, and you're just like, "That looks like a concussion." <laughs> problem the nfl had i don't know man but whatever man whatever works man yeah i guess well i guess uh i don't know i there's a few people i think i could i'd like to see uh uh do a slap fight uh at least with me and my enemies um yeah. evidently uh elon musk and mark uh zuckerberg have announced their they might do a cage fight yeah i mean that's one you'd rather see them do a slap fight than a cage fight i mean i'd yeah, pay to not watch them yeah because they're just going to pull each other's hair pretty yeah. much and i don't know take swipes at each other with their with their hp calculators or something i don't know what goes on their pocket protectors or something i don't know yeah <laughs> make, make fun of your ability i don't know maybe they'll just take turns going and deep diving uh submersibles that aren't certified and see how that works yeah um there's I mean, that. that was the whole boxing celebrity boxing from the early 2000s if you remember fox yeah. used to play like tom arnold i think did oh it. yeah yeah and the screech uh, what's his name dustin diamond mm -hmm. And Tanya Harding do um I forget who the, the matchups were, but yeah, there was a period where you I think could it was Tanya Harding in a stuff. kneecap, I think, uh, yeah. versus kneecap. Something but like that. It was a whole series. Yeah. I mean it's it's fascinating. You know, I anytime I see Cage fighting, I, I just think of that uh that movie uh like, oh, Thunderdome, you know, two men okay. enter, one man leave. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, God bless that show. Uh, so thank you very much for coming on the show, Michael. We really appreciate it. It's been a lot thank of fun. You. And I think people are really, of course, going to join the book because there's so many fans for this too as well. Yeah, I appreciate it. I hope so. There uh, you go. Work very hard on it. Hope there you go. Like it. So we don't have a, a dot com or a plug. Uh, so people just uh, click the link on the Chris Voss show. You'll see it, of course, posted everywhere. Uh, order the book where refined books are sold. Cage Kings, how an unlikely group of moguls, champions, and hustlers transformed the USC into a 10 billion dollar industry what an incredible story uh thanks so much for tuning in go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss youtube.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss and find us over at tiktok at chris foss one and the chris foss show podcast thanks for tuning in be good to each other stay safe we'll see you guys next time and that should have us out man